On behalf of myself and the people here at Makino, I'd like to welcome you to today's Makino Experience Center, or EC. As an introduction, my name is Bill Howard. I'm the product line manager for vertical machining centers here at Makino. Today's topic we're going to talk about is advantages of a vertical machining center. A little bit of housekeeping while we're on this slide here. In the top right hand corner, you'll see circled there, there's a chat and Q&A. Well, as we're going through this experience center today, if something should prompt a question in your mind, please feel free to type it in, hit send, and we'll be able at the end of the session today to address as many of those questions and hopefully I can uh, provide you with some answers relative to those questions. I'm coming to you today from one of two experience centers at the McKino Mason headquarters building, which is the picture on the right. Uh, we also have two additional experience centers on uh, the Auburn Hills facility in Auburn Hills, Michigan, just north of uh, the city of Detroit. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the experience centers and what a unique experience it is. What it allows us to do is we can bring our team in this room and you can put your team in a room and consequently we can have a meeting and it's a confidential focused on your needs that we can share back and forth and the neat thing about it is you can have your whole team involved we can have our whole team involved so it doesn't matter whether you want to talk about a machine an application automation some manufacturing issues and problems that we can work co collaboratively to solve it it also takes away the concern or the worry about well, who do I send? This allows your whole team to be involved and allows us to bring all of our team members in here. So you don't have to sort and pick and choose and obviously you don't have the expense of the travel. So as we go through this, if you're having some thoughts or some projects that you would like to sit down and again have a very confidential, focused, experience center meeting with us, please feel free to contact your local Makino representative to set this up. Today, as I said, the Experience Center is the advantages of a vertical machining center. And obviously, as the vertical product line manager, I'm very interested in this topic, and I hope you are too. Are there advantages to a vertical machining center? Well, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the history of Makino, but Makino started out in 1937 building vertical machining centers. So, we go way back. We have a lot of experience. And obviously, over the years, vertical machining centers have changed. This happens to be today's PS105. So one of the things about vertical machining centers, and, and you may not consider it an advantage, but economics is a major player in today's world. Key factors about the vertical machining center market. Between 2011 and 2022, which is the last year I have full data for, so about 11 years, there were almost 100,000, there were 93,712 verticals sold in the United States. That means there were about 8,000, 7,809, so almost 8,000 verticals a year put into the market. There you can see, uh, actually, you can see here 2021 was a, a peak year. There were over 9,000, 9,333 verticals. You can see there the average, and you can see the red line, the red dotted line. Verticals are increasing as a percentage of the market. Now, another key fact, over that same 10-year, 11-year period, there were 256 different builders that brought machines or sold machines into the United States. So obviously there's a wide variety of machines and a very, very huge volume of vertical machining centers. The biggest user is the SIC 3597 or NAICS, you know, 33271. 
It, basically, it's job shops. And if you go in and look at Dun & Bradstreet or Hoover's, there's over almost 22,000 job shops. And they represent over just about a third, 35, 36% of all verticals in the, in the United States. So, and again, most job shops are making a variety of different components and parts, different materials for different, um, different customers. And if you want to kind of get an idea, that's, that's just the job shops plotted on that map. So, obviously, there's a ton of them out there. Well, let's compare it to a horizontal. Uh, the average vertical, they're about 7,800 units a year. Horizontal is about 1,700. So there's 4.5, you know, four and a half times more verticals being sold into the United States market as there are horizontals. And as we said earlier, the vertical population is increasing, and you can see the horizontal population is stagnant to slightly decreasing. So, what does that mean? Well, verticals are the most popular choice in milling machines. They're more widely available. There's a variety, 256 different manufacturers, variety of choices and configuration. The other thing, if you look at USMTO, United States Machine Tool Organization, which is AMT, basically, you go in and look at that, the average vertical price is a little over $130,000. The average horizontal price is a little over $400,000. So you can see that the horizontal is more than three times the price of an average vertical. And so therefore, economically, you could purchase three verticals for the same amount of money that you have tied up in one horizontal. So, that's kind of the economics and the overview of the market. Obviously, the cost of the vertical is more economical. It's lower, so the cost of operation and production goes down, meaning you can pass the savings on to your customers, particularly those folks in that very, very competitive job shop market. Next, it's easy to use. Well, what do I mean by easy to use? Well, typically a vertical is three axes, Z, X, Typically, the table moves side to side for X and front to back for Y. So, therefore, it's easier to program. I mean, you think about it, you're just going to take and position the part to where you want it, X and Y, and then you're going to move in Z. So, easier to program, less complicated, three axis typically. Ease of use, it's very easy to use. And again, we've got you know, more, more than four times the numbers of folks out there with experience in verticals versus experience in horizontals. It's shorter learning curve. You have more people that know it, so you're lower initial cost. It's an ideal machine for small shops, startups, your first CNC, vertical, there you go, or if you're doing prototype type work. More skilled workers, we said earlier, there's more workers, more of a workforce with vertical machining center experience. So there's more folks out there in the market familiar with VMCs. Therefore, economically, you'd say if there is more of something, it ought to be a little lower priced. So the lower cost for labor because there's four times, more than four times the numbers of folks that can run a vertical versus running a horizontal. The other benefit to you as a company, you know, and I think a lot of job shops are relatively small, but if you could go out and find several people trained to operate the vertical, and there's a large population of those folks, it's advantageous to your business because now you're not dependent upon one individual. You could have multiple shifts, so now you're going to amortize the cost of that machine over first shift, second shift, maybe even third shift, and it gives you a, a continuity not only with your, your manufacturing operation, but your company and your business. So a continuity, more people. Parts and service is another big issue. As I said, there's about 8,000 machines a year, over 7,000, 8,000. So parts and service, because of the popularity of vertical machining centers, there's more machines involved, therefore there's going to be a higher availability of parts, 
Typically those parts, because of the volumes, are going to be at lower costs, and therefore you're going to have also, again, four times the number, of, or four and a half times the number of verticals as horizontals, you're going to have larger numbers of service folks. So higher availability, quicker response time, and again, it kind of gives you an assurance as a, a job shop owner or a manufacturer that your company in business is going to have some continuity because of the availability of not only parts, but trained service folks as well. Let's talk about the structure of a vertical. As I said earlier, typically on a vertical machining center, the table moves side to side for X and front to back for Y. So if you put a part on there, it's a simple matter of telling, you know, where to go in X, where to go in Y, and then bring Z down. So like I said, X and Y are on, under the part. Very stiff. That's the other thing about it. The table is here, the carrier, and the bed. So very stiff, very rigid. And then the spindle motion is straight up and down. So it's not like a horizontal where it's pointing out here and you have gravitational impact or effect. It also allows you to have very good, excellent straightness in motion. And that's your classic movements, obviously, of X, Y, and Z relative to the Cartesian coordinate system of how you program a machine tool. Here's an example. This happens to be a PS105, but you can see here the table. The table moves side to side for X. The table moves front to back for Y. And obviously, the spindle comes down for Z. Now, here's an example of simplistic or how easy it is to envision and see a part being machined. We've got a part on here, and you're going to see us literally moving X and Y as we mill around the periphery of that part. So there you can see, there's X, here's Y. We're going to get back in the corner, now we're going back in X, and here we're coming back in Y to finish the part. So very easy to, to picture an image and program around that part. The simple structure also means there's a minimal number of axes. So therefore, you have a minimal number of variables to control. Roll, pitch, yaw, straightness, squareness, parallelism. Therefore, by minimizing the variables, we can have higher static and dynamic stiffness and rigidity. As I said earlier, you have the part on the table, on the carrier, to the bed. So very short, compact force circle, very good stiffness and rigidity. And it's also because of the minimal number of, of axes and componentry, it's easier to maintain the very basic axes. The other thing about it, if you think about a horizontal, the spindle's like this. Here we're coming like this. So the mechanical structure of a vertical will always be more balanced and stable in an axis vertical to the workpiece than, and parallel to gravity, that's another thing, than to try to go against gravity. So simple structure. Uh, here we're showing off some of the benefits, if you will, of a vertical machining center. We're going to do some very aggressive plunge cutting, and you'll notice the workpiece is right in the center of the table, so it's literally workpiece to table to carrier to bed to foundation. So there you can see some pretty aggressive plunge cutting. And again, this is on a Makino PS105 machine. There's a higher degree of accuracy as well. Because of the simple structure and the ability, the relationships between x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis, we can maintain very tight geometries. So therefore, if you look at that volume that you're moving, x, y, z, we can have higher volumetric accuracies. That's one of the reasons, and you'll look at a couple die mold components there, that's one of the reasons that the vertical machining center is very highly populated in the die mold market. The other thing is because you're going in this direction, if you're boring or drilling, there's, no, again, no gravitational impact or effect and, and stiffness and rigidity. It's reminiscent, if you will, of a drill press. You're doing a lot of plunge type cutting where you position the part under the spindle and then here's drilling and tapping, another example, or boring and reaming, 
There's an example of boring and reaming. And then finally, we showed you a minute ago a milling application with a, a plunge cut type of thing. Now, this is a classic example. We're moving in Y as we're going up and down in Z, and we're drilling pattern. Now, obviously, if we needed to move X to put holes in the other direction, we could do that. Here's an example where we've stepped down in X and now have stepped back in, in Y, so we're milling that back uh, drilled hole there. So again, very easy. That's also an example we'll talk about later of using a vise. And then here is, again, the stiffness and rigidity of the machine in a fairly good horsepower uh, cut, end milling cut on that machine. So higher degree of accuracy. It allows us to produce complex shapes with a high degree of precision or accuracy. So if you start getting into complex contoured small step parts, typical of the die and mold market, um, that's a strong suit for a vertical machining center. And again, keep in mind, Makino started making vertical machining centers in 1937. Uh, the other thing, if you look around the die mold market, you'll notice the dominance of vertical machining centers in the die mold marketplace. So some examples there. Here's an example, and this is a mold. And uh, what we're doing is you'll see we're moving it in X and Y, and we're contouring down in Z, stepped Z axis. Uh, do you ever wonder how they make forged golf clubs? Well, here's an example of making a forging die for, a, I don't know, seven iron, something. But it gives you an idea there. Uh, less floor space. Well, due to the simple structure and the compactness of the design, a vertical requires less floor space than a horizontal. There's a typical vertical. Here's a typical horizontal. And so consequently, you got less cost because you got significantly less floor space. The other thing it allows you to do, if these boxes that you put the machines in can be closer together, it makes material flow and workflow and people flow much more convenient, closer together. So you can have a, a higher degree of visuality and control over the manufacturing floor, as well as streamlining the manufacturing operation. Here's an example. Take a PS105. It's about 90 square feet. Take a comparable horizontal. It's about 160 square feet. Well, at, a, at $100 a square foot, that horizontal is going to cost you about $16,000 in floor space, where the vertical is going to cost you about seven. So there's a difference there of $7,000, which is about a 43% reduction in your floor space cost. The other thing is, as you can see, the horizontal requires about 78% more floor space per machine. Another example or another advantage of a vertical machining center, there's two uh, on the left um, is a PS105, on the right is an F9. The thing to notice on both of these is the massiveness, the heavy castings. There's a lot of cast iron there. In most cases, we're anywhere from 16 to 30,000 pounds of cast iron. Well, you say, okay, what's that do for you? Well, it gives you very good thermal characteristics. Those heavy castings means that you have a longer time constant. What that means is it's going to take longer for the machine to change temperature as a result of the ambient air. What's that do for you? Well, it means that you're going to have a longer period of stable temperatures and accuracies on the machine, no matter what your shop environment does around you. So it extends the time to change the temperature of the machine. That's what a thermal time constant does. There's going to be less errors due to thermal, simply because of the long cycle time it takes to change temperature, which is going to be very beneficial, again, in the dye mold industry, where typically you have parts that have very long cycle times. Another thing that it, intuitively it makes sense, but you don't really think about it, coolant delivery. Vertical machining centers, the coolant comes from nozzles around the spindle, flood nozzles, overhead nozzles. 
And basically it flows down over the tool, the interface between the tool and the workpiece, the workpiece, and then the fixture and the table and down into the machine. Well, that delivery, the structure is conducive to using that coolant flowing down over that to cool, take away the heat of the cutting, and to the C-frame open construction, have access to air. So you can flow target high temperature areas with the coolant and maintain temperature with the work, the tool, the fixture. And as it cascades down over the part and the fixture and the machine, the table, the bed, you know, it will help maintain the temperature of the machine as well. The benefits of gravity here again aid in that gravitational flow from top to bottom of the coolant. Another note there, if you, know, you want to even get tighter tolerances, you can put a, a coolant temperature controller on the coolant tank and it will monitor the temperature of the bed of the machine and cycle on and off to maintain the temperature of the coolant relative to the bed of the machine. So again, that will even help narrow uh, any thermal impacts. And here's just showing how the coolant comes from the nozzles around the spindle, through spindle, through the tool. You can see the flood nozzles and over in the background there, you can also see the overhead flow nozzles. Simpler setups. A lot of parts you can take a flat plate and you can just fasten it to the table. You can go in and work one half the part, flip it over, cut the other half, and you've got a finished part. Large blocks of material, again, fasten it right to the table. Very minimal fixturing, just clamp it down and off you go. Um, there's another example in a die mold application. Or you can go into one of the simplest things to do is go in and utilize vices. One vice, two vices, multiple vices. And these can be used as a single setup single vise, multiple setups. You could have a vise that has different notches or stop blocks on it and could service as a family of parts into that. So you can have single, multiple, and can be very versatile, can service a whole grouping of parts. Now, this example here shows a whole bunch of vices in a row. The other thing about this, these can be automated as well. So they can automatically uh, open and close, chuck. The simpler setup allows you to have faster setups. Make the, you know, in some cases with a vise, multiple parts, you may not have any setup at all or changeover. Multiple parts run in the same vise. It's easy to load and unload. It's quick, saves time, and that's ultimately what you want to do here. And it can be very good for high volume. It can also be very good or ideal for prototype parts where you're making one off at a time. It's relatively low cost, so it's very economical. With the automation caveat there, and that's obviously one of the complaints about vertical machining centers is you have to stop the spindle to go in and take the part off and put another part on. Well, that's true unless you put some type of automation to automatically go in there and do that, in which case you can get productivity rates on a vertical very comparable to a horizontal with a pallet changer. You're doing the same type of automation only on a vertical spindle versus a horizontal. Think about certain parts. Here as an example is a big flat plate. That plate is 40 by 20. Now just imagine how big of a horizontal machining center you'd have to have to put that plate on it and machine it. Well, obviously it's ideal, the vertical for large flat plate work. Think about that part there. That's actually in our facility. That's a F9 machine. And what you're seeing there is a carrier off of an F5 machine. So we actually use our own machines to machine parts for our own machines. Here's another example. That's a table off of an F5. So you'll see that, again, uh, one of the unique Makino type designs there is that whole corner opens up so you can easily get the part in and out of the machine and do setup, tram and a bore, tram and a fixture, getting set up. That's the flip side of that table. Outstanding ergonomics. Typically on a vertical machining center, the table moves towards the operator. So therefore, 
It's a very short distance from the operator to the front of the table. It's an easy reach. And if you want to manually load and unload or check tooling, it's easily reachable from the front of the machine. In addition, the control's right there. So your information is right at hand. It's easier to debug programs. You can literally sit there and see the table move in, in X and Y and the spindle in Z. So you can see and observe the cutting action. Very low fatigue because you're moving it out here. You're working very close to your body. So low fatigue means you have minimal part change times, productivity. And then the other thing is full access overhead. Here you can see we've got a crane where the door, when you open the door, you have full access into the work zone for an overhead crane. VMC design also provides much better visibility into the work zone. If you think about a horizontal, typically it's, you know, you're back here and there's a wall between where you load and it's being machined. Here you can literally look right into the work zone. You can observe the cutting. You can detect any issues or problems. If necessary, the control's right there. You can intervene, stop, make changes. You can maintain the tooling and alter the programs. So outstanding ergonomics. And last but not least is ease of automation. The simplicity of a vertical machining center, you know, again, front to back is Y, side to side is X, makes it very easy to add something like a table changer. So here, this happens to be a Mitico table changer on a PS series machine. There's a table full of finished parts coming out. Saddle moves forward, grabs the next pallet, and there it goes. So you can see very quick, there's 40 some parts on that table. So very quick way uh, to keep the spindle busy on a vertical machining center. Another way of easing automation goes into rotary workheads. Uh, on the vertical machining center. Now here's an example, and what you'll see is we have a vertical, uh, vertical ro a rotary table with a tailstock, and the workpiece fixture is in between. So you'll notice we can work on one surface, we can do compound angles, we can tilt it over and have different part on the back side, we can have a window to reach through, there you can see. So this allows you to have multiple side access compound angle hole capability on a vertical machining center. Another one is auto doors, uh, either a single machine with a robot. Here's an example. You can see it's a Makino PS65, but there's the auto doors. You'll see a robot come in. It's going to grab the part. Now, the other thing here is um, we don't have an operator there now, so what this is doing is it's turning the part up so all the coolant comes out in the machine so that we can manage it on the machine, and then it's going to bring the finished part out. And then another method of automation is a robot with multiple machines. And you're going to see here a three-machine cell with a pedestal robot, and it's going to move parts from machine to machine to machine, up one, up two, up three, and then obviously out to a finished conveyor. So there's picking up parts there. It can pick them up, move them to the other machines. They'll see one, two, and then the third machine is off to the right. There you can kind of see it. And then there's the outfeed conveyor right there. So ease of automation. That allows you to address one of the, the big complaints about verticals is spindle utilization because you've got to stop the spindle, open the doors to unload, reload apart. Obviously, we can now automate that vertical, and we can get the same types of productivity that you can get in a horizontal. So at this point in time, that completes the formal presentation that I have. So we'd like to open it up for questions. While we were chatting, there were a couple questions that came in. Um, I'm going to kind of watch the time here. One of them was about automation costs. Automation really kind of depends on a, a bunch of things. Number one, how big your part is, how much does it weigh, you know, how many machines you're going to service, how far of a reach. Uh, but in general, a table changer is can be very economical. Uh, we showed the Mitico on the PS105 there. That's a very economical approach. Um, we can also go to a, like a Boxy. I don't know if you've heard of Boxy or an Aroa. So that allows us, and the, the key thing that's addressing is the ability 
to change parts in and out of the machine while the spindle's running. So to improve the productivity of the machine um, while it's running, you don't have to stop the spindle and go in there. And that's the whole idea is keep the spindle cutting uh, and the utilization. Um, the other thing was floor space. The question kind of came along with uh, the floor space uh, for automation is, um, do you, uh, how much floor space does it take? Well, keep in mind now the verticals are significantly smaller, you know, than the typical horizontal. So even if you add some of this automation, like a pedestal robot, very minimal amount of space, even like a Mitoco table changer or a boxy. So typically um, there'll be significant floor space advantages on the vertical machining center, even if you have the automation on the machine. Um, oh, there was a question here about uh, accuracy between a C-frame and a bridge style. Um, this, basically, the difference there is a C-frame is the Z is straight up and down on the column, and then X and Y are under the table. And we, we kind of showed that a number. The PS105 machine is that way. So X is side to side, and the table is front to back. That's, that's a classic kind of C-frame. Um, a bridge style machine, and there's all kinds of ways to do a bridge. Uh, the classic bridge is you have X, Y, and Z all up overhead. You have a fixed table so that you're moving X, Y, and Z. And, um, you know, it's I can't say all, but the key thing you got to watch with bridge style designs is typically you set the part down on the table and you have a very long reach with uh, basically the RAM to get down to the part. And then obviously, depending on where you're at in X and Y, they're way out in the middle of the travels. So you can get very, uh, you can get vibration chatter and, and you can get deflection as a result of cutting way down at the end of the RAM and the RAM being out suspended in between, you know, your X and Y support. So uh, I would say that Typically, a C-frame is going to be more accurate than a bridge style. But again, there's a lot of nuances on bridge style. Uh, next question was, uh, does the fourth axis compromise the accuracy versus the three axis? And um, <laughs> I don't want to be smart about this. I mean, I, I, this is not a, but it really, a lot of it depends on the table you buy. Um, there are a lot of differences in tables. Uh, you know, if you're going to buy a Sudacoma or a Nikon or, you know, a top quality table like that, uh, typically the tables are going to be pretty accurate. And the other thing too, depends on if you're going to put a tailstock there and have a, basically a fixture between the rotary table and the tailstock. So you have some rigidity and support. You're not cantilevering the part away from the face of the vertical rotary table. Most of the vertical rotary tables, you know, your positioning accuracy is you're looking at plus or minus 12 arc seconds. Your repeatability is, you know, plus or minus five, something like that. So it, it really uh, depends. Uh, most people aren't machining high percentages of the part on the rotary table. So I would say that in general, as long as you buy a, a, a quality vertical rotary table and you know you're not extending your workpiece way out away from the faceplate that there wouldn't be any compromise at all in the accuracy uh, on the machine of adding a quality vertical rotary table versus what you have there on the X, Y, and Z standard axes. Um, at this point in time, I don't see any other questions to come in. So I'd like to take on behalf of myself and the people here at Makino, thank you for joining us today for the Experience Center Advantages of a Vertical Machining Center. As the Vertical Product Line Manager, hopefully you got some information here that is, uh, you know, is meaningful. And by the way, if you'd saw something that say, gee, I'd like to share this. If you registered for this, you should be getting an email here and that will have a link. 
So if you have other folks in your organization that you would like to share this with, you'll be able to do that. Or otherwise, this will be posted to our archives. It'll be at www.makino.com. So again, thank you very much for joining us.